This is the Maryland Native Plant Society's webinar, 50 Shades of Green and Pink, Lavender and White and Yellow, Spring Native Wildflowers and Foliage with Carol Bergman. I'm Ann DeNovo, I'll be your host. Our speaker this evening, Carol Bergman, needs no introduction for many of you because she was the founder and for many years, the moving force behind Montgomery County's incredibly successful Weed Warriors program. And she was a tireless fighter against non-native invasive plants and advocate for natural areas and native plants in Montgomery County. She is a recently retired forest ecologist and field botanist naturalist and teacher. She has worked extensively in the fields of natural resource management and ecological restoration for over 30 years. She was the field botanist and forest ecologist for the countywide Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. She is a past president of the Maryland Native Plant Society, has served on the board for many years and is currently serving on the board. She also serves on the board of the Montgomery Countryside Alliance and the Montgomery County Forestry Board. In addition to founding and running the Weed Warriors program, she has also taught botanical classes for the Audubon Naturalist Society, for the Natural History Field Studies Program. She's been a field trip leader and lecturer for other botanical interest groups in the area. So now, Carol, I'm going to turn it over to you. Good evening, everyone. It's so great to be sharing this nature hour with all of you. But before I start, I want to give one brief word of appreciation and thanks. A good friend of mine, Chris Fleming, passed away in the middle of January. I expect that many of you knew her and admired Chris the way I did. She was an accomplished botanist, a dedicated teacher and field trip leader for literally decades. I've heard many fellow plantaholics credit Chris with their first awakening regarding the fascinating world of plants. Since Chris often gave the spring wildflower talk for Maryland Native Plant Society in the past, I'd like to dedicate this presentation to her. Thank you, Chris. So tonight we will be walking through the woods from right around the vernal equinox that was March 20th, 2020 to the end of May, 2020. So every picture was taken by me last year, the COVID year, over a 10 week period. I often start a presentation or a field trip with a map of the area to be discussed. But tonight, I will just say that all of the pictures were taken in public parks. 98% were taken in Montgomery County. So we will basically be in the Maryland Piedmont tonight. Remember when you are out on a hike in regard to what types of plants live where, so much does depend on various factors like soil type, bedrock, topography, aspect, hydrology, and the microclimate, especially in the early spring. A number of the same species that you see blooming over along the Potomac River floodplain might not bloom until a week later in the floodplain of Little Bennett Park. So the bottom line is there's a huge range of possibilities for you to explore within a short drive and within a short time. So let's do it. All right, so when you go out in the woods in the middle of March. It looks a lot like this up here on the top right. Uh, none of the native trees have leafed out yet. There are some marcescent leaves still hanging in on the beech trees, but otherwise when you look down on the ground you'll see mainly plants that have been there all winter like this is a native orchid, the Tipularia discolor or cranes fly orchid. This is the cardamony diphylla or broadleaf toothwort, or you might see the seed cases for the another uh, native orchid, the rattlesnake plantain. But if you're doing some exploring and you go wandering down to a vernal pool, you might see, be lucky enough to see egg masses for wood frogs. And those are greening up because uh, algae grows on top of them. And it's a good 
camouflage for those eggs while they develop into frogs. But if you are looking down at the forest floor around the spring equinox, the most obvious green patches of native herbaceous plants that you see will most probably be spring beauties or fairy spuds. Fairy spuds, because they do have little potatoes, meaning little tubers or corms, as well as a fibrous root system for underground storage. And spring beauties because, well, they're beautiful. <laughs> Despite being so small, if you take the time to get down and examine one, you will see that they have delicate pink and yellow nectar guides. They have bright pink anthers. Despite being so small, they produce generous amounts of nectar and pollen that's eaten by at least 23 species of native bees. Bumblebees, mining bees, honeybees, surfeit flies. They even have their own specialist mining bee, Adrena uroginii, which relies almost exclusively on the pollen of spring beauties to feed its young. And here I want to draw attention to the genus Andrena uh, and to the concept of a mining bee. A mining bee is a solitary bee, they nest in the ground. Each mining bee female usually digs her own burrow to rear her young. They're generally smaller than a honeybee. They aren't aggressive and they will fly just above the ground in the forest duff layer. Andrina bees are important pollinators, especially for a number of the spring ephemerals. Before I go on, I wanna point out that the typical spring beauty has five pale pink to white colored petals. But last March, I happened upon a 10 petaled spring beauty. Isn't that lovely? It was like finding a four leaf or maybe a five leaf clover. <laughs> so of course I had to throw in its picture. But besides providing nectar and pollen for 23 species of native bees, the, the uh, spring beauty has another trick up its sleeve. And that would be miramacocory. And what the heck is miramacocory? That's a fancy word for seed dispersal by ants. So what happens is that the plants, Spring Beauty and here Dutchman's Riches, have partnered over time with the ants. The, the plant makes an aliasome, which is a nutrient and lipid rich packet that's attached to the, the seed. The ant takes that eliasome, which is attached to the ski seed, into their nest, and they feed the, the eliasome to their young. The ants then leave the seed in the nest. So the nest, you know, is an enriched, protected spot with no birds or other seed-eating animals in there, and fire can't get to the, the seed. And it's also away from the parent plant, at least by a couple feet away from the parent plant, so there's less competition from other seeds that drop right there. It's estimated that as much as 30% of spring flowering herbaceous plants in eastern North American forests have evolved to provide food attached to their seeds, just precisely to entice the ants to disperse their seeds. So some additional wildflowers that produce eliasomes besides spring beauty and Dutchman's riches are bloodroot, hepatica, trillium, trout lily, twin leaf, wild ginger, bellworts, windflowers, violets. It's amazing. Another thing about Dutchman's riches before we go on is that they bloom just when our native bumblebee queens the bombus species emerge from hibernation. And so they supply critical nectar, which is energy for the queens and pollen, which is food for the larva. So in the same type of rich floodplain forest that you would typically find Dutchman's britches, you might also spot some very much less showy <laughs> spring green clumps. Both of these are diminutive. Why would I bring these up? They look like just some tiny little green leaves in the forest duff, so easily overlooked. I bring them up because I think they're the type of plant that a curious plantaholic 
like someone that would attend this webinar may truly wonder about. If you see a Dutchman's Bridges and you don't know what it is, you can pretty much go to any field guide and figure out what it is. But a false mermaid weed uh, or an erigenia when it's not in bloom, that's a bit harder. So here we have the other reason that I wanted to bring up something like this is that both of these plants are a monotypic genus. And what that means is that it's a genus that only contains one species. So Floerchia proserpinacoides, lots of name for very small plant, is a monotypic genus in the meadowfoam family. And that means that false mermaid weed is the only species in the Floerchia genus. Same here with Aragina bulbosa or Harbinger of Spring. It is the only species in the Aragina genus. So these, the Harbinger of Spring, you should, if you see them, get down on your hands and knees and look at them. The, sea, the anthers here are a wine red color and that quickly flades, fades to black so that it's stark black and white when you look down on it. And that's where you get the other name, salt and pepper. Both of these plants in the top right <laughs> and the top left, they're very small. I threw my pen in here so you can see what we're talking about size, size wise. So just as I don't think many people will know or see a Florchia or an Erigenia, I don't think anyone in this group won't know what a spring, what a uh, Virginia bluebell is. It absolutely doesn't need introduction. Such a welcome sight in the spring. They do prefer moist areas with rich loamy soil. So my go-to place is the CNO Canal around mid to end of March. So right now, <laughs> over three weeks of bloom, they evolve from a deep pink purple to a beautiful blue. They often grow in colonies, and when they are in large colonies, it provides protective cover for many kinds of wildlife. And its foliage totally dies down by midsummer, true spring ephemerals. The flowers are cross-pollinated by long-tongued bees primarily, and you can see with this long corolla, you would need a long-tongued bee, including bumblebees, mason bees, and honeybees, as well as the giant bee fly, butterflies, skippers, sphinx moths, even ruby-throated hummingbirds have been observed visiting these flowers. And then there's hepatica. Oh, what a gorgeous plant. A gorgeous plant with many strategies for reproduction. This is a plant that you may see blooming even when there's snow around. They have winter hardy leaves. Here's a leaf which is kind of thick up all winter and green. So it photosynthesizes during the winter, takes in energy and builds up its root, its stores. It's a gorgeous flower just to attract pollinators. It has thick hairs. Look down here, isn't this cool? For insulation, warmth, and to deter the herbivores and insects that, that might climb up and steal the nectar. <laughs> they do rely on flies, beetles, bees, moths, and so forth that occur during early times for pollination. But that isn't the only trick they have up their sleeve. They also partner with ants for seed dispersal via eliasms, as I just mentioned a few minutes ago. And they produce blossoms over a span of time. In this picture, you can see what I'm talking about here. We have one flower opening, one flower totally open, and one flower past bloom already making seeds. Same over here, just opening perfectly in bloom, making seeds. And so what that does is give this plant more chance to be pollinated. It's not just open all of them at once. It gives it a chance. But if all else fails, they can self-pollinate if necessary. They come in pink and white and lavender and blue. They're just one of my favorites. And if you've never seen one, 
I think you should make a special effort to get out next year and do that. Spice bush. So looking up from the forest floor to the shrub in, in understory, we see the miniature yellow fireworks of the uh, spice bush. Spice bush or Lindira benzolin is dioecious, which means that there are separate male and female plants. Here's a picture of the male plant in bloom. You can see the stamens, which are the, the male reproductive part sticking up there. If it's a female plant, they will produce bright red lipid rich berries that many birds, especially some of our most valuable songsters, berries and wood thrushes depend on. Spicebush has many pollinary pollinators, but the primary ones are solitary native bees and flies. However, there is another thing about spice bush that's very important, and we're so introducing another concept here. Uh, they are the larval host plant for spice bush swallowtail, tulip tree beauty, and for a giant silk moth, the promethea moth. So what a larval host plant means is that when the leaves emerge, the butterflies and moths just named lay their eggs on the leaves. And when the caterpillars hatch, they eat the leaves and the caterpillars in turn become food for many birds and wildlife. Of course, the spice bush swallowtails don't necessarily want to be eaten. <laughs> so they've developed some defenses. During their first three instars, they resemble bird droppings. <laughs> Yes, they are brown and black and white, and they look just like a bird dropping. So it's not hard to understand why birds don't relish eating these caterpillars when they're at that stage. And for the last two instars, the caterpillars start to look like a miniature green snake or yellow or yellow orange snake with large black eye spots so again, it's not hard to understand why birds avoid them. Isn't that clever? Well, on top of that, spice bush is aromatic. If you haven't ever taken the time to smell the leaves, you got to do that this year. And then there's bloodroot. There's no missing them when they're open. Brilliant white face, an inch and a half to two and a half inches across. They have a relatively short bloom time like other members of the poppy family. And with little floral competition in the early spring, some ephemerals forego producing high energy nectar and offer pollen only. And that is what bloodroot does. It relies on its pretty face. <laughs> its primary pollinators are the drenid bees. And it makes a liasome, so the ants disperse their seeds, but it too will self-pollinate if necessary. They often grow in colonies, so they spread vegetatively by rhizomes as well as by seeds. And finally, just looking up here at the name, Sanguinaria canadensis. Sanguinaria is from the Latin root, sanguis, which means blood. And if you, were to break a small piece off the edge of this leaf of a blood root and dab it on your arm, you'll see that they do have a bright orange red blood sap. <laughs> um, but please don't pick a flower. If you look for the sap in the stem, then that plant will not have a chance to make a flower. I mean, make seeds that year. And then it's April. It's April and look at all of the little white flowers here. Toothwort, woodland chickweed, dwarf ginseng, Virginia saxifrage, pussy toes, rue anemone. They're all out and they're all around you under feet. Like right about now in some areas you can find these. I don't, I could spend all night talking about just groups like this, but Let's only delve into dwarf ginseng tonight. Panax trifolius, dwarf ginseng. I'm talking about it because it actually has a plant life cycle that involves a sex or ginger, ginger, gender change. 
So what I mean there is when the plants are very small, they don't bear flowers. They only produce leaves. When they're first large enough to have flowers, all the flowers will be male. And that's because producing pollen requires a lot less stored energy than making seeds. When the plants are finally large enough, they will produce bisexual flowers. So the plants with functional pistils and stamen will produce fruit. So after producing seed, the plant will in the following year most likely go back to just producing male flowers. And the plants can alternate between the two genders during their lifetime. This is a rare sexual system for a plant. And then trout lilies, who doesn't love a trout lily? <laughs> you often see large colonies of single leaf plants, trout lily plants, and may be only a very few, if any, flowers. Someone always asks me about this on any field trip I lead in the spring. And the reason is because only mature, that's two leafed plants, flower. And it takes eight years to get to flowering stage. Trout lilies have their own special <laughs> Adrena mining bee, the and Andrena erythronii. And here I will point out that trout lilies Latin name is Erythronium americanum, so Andrena erythronii. Trout lilies make eliosomes and they grow in colonies which can be 100 years old. This is the thing that is just astounding to me, that you could be looking at a colony of these little trout lilies that are 100 years old. One other thing I didn't mention, to leverage uh, its chances of reproductive success, the trout lily opens half of its anthers, it has six anthers, one day, and does the other three another day. Again, this is an idea of trying to make sure you get a pollinator. And it also bends downwards. It looks at the, the ground here because the little mining bees float along the ground. So this makes it much more obvious for them. Ruin enemy, the Lictrum thalactroides, a true spring ephemeral. It produces no nectar like the uh, bloodroot, only pollen, but it does attract bees and flies. It has a staggered bloom so that one bloom is always open over a period of several days. It usually has about five, five blooms per little plant. And it produces eliosomes so the ants produce, uh, disperse the seeds. Like other members of the buttercup family, its foliage causes a burning sensation. So herbivores, including deer, avoid eating it. Finally, I want to point out it has bright yellow stamens. And you compare that, this is rue anemone, with wood anemone, which has bright white <laughs> anthers there, see. So wood anemones produce eliosomes, grow in mats as well via rhizomes underground to ramp up their chances of reproducing uh, flowers, a single plant takes up to five years to flower. One other point, these plants, rude anemone and wood anemone, both of them, another name for them is windflower. And windflower is a perfect name in my opinion. The slightest breeze makes them tremble and quake. They're really pretty as they bob and sway but also it makes it really hard to get a good picture. So don't be too critical if it's, if it's not in focus. I'm sorry. I also have here wild geranium, also called cranes bill, geranium maculatum, a beautiful lavender flower. It has many native pollinators, including a specialist mining bee, Andrina distans, also called the Cranesbill miner. And it has a different kind of flower development, which is called protandrus. And I wanted to bring this up just to let you <laughs> learn that in this plant, the stamens, the male reproductive parts, mature first. Here are the stamens around the edge. They mature first before the female organs, the, the pistil. Therefore, ensuring that self 
fertilization doesn't occur. So you say, why is it preferable that it doesn't occur? Well, because cross-pollination is preferable to self-pollination because it produces more genetic diversity in plant po populations. Genetic diversity plays an important role in the plant's adaptability and survivability so of a species. The cardamines, beautiful little toothworts. We have cut leaf toothwort, broad leaf toothwort, and bulbous toothwort. All of these live around here. They're all in the mustard family, uh, also known as Brassicaceae or Cruciferae. They have four petals or little white petals. And flea beetles, the same flea beetles that eat the foliage in your garden if you're planting broccoli, kale, cabbage, and other members of the mustard family will eat the foliage of your toothworts out in the wood, in the woods. They have their own, they have a specialized andrina, arabis, mining bee to collect the pollen. And they are also the larval host plant for mustard white, falcate orange tip, and the endangered West Virginia white butterflies. All of these these three can be found in Little Bennett, but at different, in different numbers and in different habitats. Far and away, uh, cutleaf toothwort is the most common in Montgomery County, and broadleaf is found in Little Bennett in about the same kind of conditions as cutleaf. The cardamine bulbosa is much, much less common. I only find it in very moist soils, usually in bottomland forests and swamps or on the edge of a seep or spring. So I just want to take a second here for us to take a pause. We're standing on a trail and looking into one typical upland forest in the Maryland Piedmont in the many shades of green phase. I want to emphasize again that these are intricately intertwined systems. We should walk carefully. We should stay on the trails as much as possible. We should keep dogs on a leash. As someone who loves all this, as I know all of you do, you can help instill a sense of value, a sense of care in others. It's important. We need awareness. We need preservation. We need conservation. And then there's skunk cabbage. Again, I don't think there's anyone in this crowd that needs to be told what this plant is. I took these pictures in April, so skunk cabbage was long past blooming. Its flower can poke up through the snow. Um, and that's because this is one of the few plants to perform thermogenesis. It can actually heat itself up and the surrounding area right around it to 72 degrees. <laughs> it's pollinated by flies that are attracted to the carrion-like scent of the bloom. And then if you ever break a petal off, a petal, rather a leaf, and take a whiff, you'll know why it's called skunk cabbage, and that repels herbivores. Funny thing. Skunk cabbage also has something cool called contractile roots, and that means that the roots actually pull the plant down into the wetland. We have another, though contractile roots aren't that common, we have another um, very common plant that has contractile roots, and that would be the dandelion. If you've ever tried to pull out a dandelion from your yard, you might think it's pulling back. Well, that's because it is. <laughs> yes, they have a long tap root, but they have contractile roots. The, I think the most incredible thing about this plant, though, to me, is that I, I have read that it can live to 200 years if left undisturbed. Now, isn't that just mind-blowing. Who would know that? We've got to save these areas. So the carrion-like scent that we were just talking about is often found in maroon, dark green, brown flowers, and a couple others that have that color flower would be pawpaw, a semina triloba. It is um, a small tree, actually. It has evolved flowers that attract blowflies or carrion beetles who naturally feed on dead and decaying animals. In addition to that, when it gets its leaves, these leaves get to be six to 12 inches long and the, the pawpaw is the larval host plant for zebra swallowtails. Zebra swallowtails are 
gorgeous little black and white, just like a zebra, swallowtail butterfly that you often see in early spring flying where there's a pawpaw patch. They have pungent scented foliage. The deer don't browse it. It's a colonial grower. You often see big colonies. And it's, it has a special way of developing its reproductive reproductive system as well. You remember that the geranium was protrandus, meaning, or rather protandus, <laughs> meaning the male flowers matured first. The pawpaw is just the opposite. It's called protagynus, or the female reproductive organ. The stigma comes to maturity before the male. And so it's no longer receptive when the male pollen is ready and shed. So that plant, this plant cannot self-fertilize. On top of all of these things, it's a member of the tropical custard apple family. And its fruit tastes like a combination of a mango and a banana. And many animals, including the human animal, love it. So if you haven't tasted one yet, um, try to do it sometime. Here are two more plants that have that maroon, brown, dark red, whatever, flower color and foul scent that draw flies to carrion. It would be wild ginger, Asarum canadens, and Troche trillium, trillium sesily. I wanted to make one comment before I go on here, and that would be that because the offspring of plants like these, which produce eliosomes, <laughs> so that their seeds are dispersed by ants, because offspring of plants with ant dispersed seeds usually remain pretty local, I don't know, need to explain that. We can't imagine an ant lugging an eliosome with a seed for a mile. <laughs> At the most, they probably go a couple yards away to their place, uh, unlike something that where the plants are just dis dispersed their seeds by wind or birds, which could be a long way away. So habitat fragmentation is a major threat to the survival of spring ephemerals. One of these plants, you know, once these plants are gone from a section of forest, that's a combination of factors make it uncommon that they're going to return the same way. So please teach others not to dig them up from the woods. And then there's the violet. Oh my gosh, I hate to admit that at one time I just dismissed violets with the thought, oh, it's just a violet. And I didn't really dig into figuring out what its many attributes are. So let me try and repair that damage. Um, violets are the larval host plant for fritillary butterflies and 21 additional species of Lep Lepidoptera. So what that means is 21 additional species of butterflies and moths lay their eggs on violets. The caterpillars, when they hatch, eat the leaves. So think of all of that help <laughs> and importance. The violets have little nectar signposts going in there. The violets close at night and put their head down to protect the pollen. <laughs> violets Beyond making seeds through fertilization uh, of the flowers that we call violets, violets have a plan B. <clears throat> they also have what's called cleistogamous flowers. These are closed flowers that don't have petals. They're white and they're bent down and they're down underneath these flowers and leaves these white things down under the ground. They're kind of bent over. Um, these cleistogamous or closed flowers produce seeds through self-fertilization. Those seeds are formed, those, all the seeds of the violets are formed in three-parted capsules, which burst open when they're ripe and fling, just absolutely fling the seeds out by mechanical ejection. So besides doing all that, they've got a great root system that consists of thick horizontally branched rhizomes, so they can spread all over your yard. <laughs> Yes, there's a tendency to form vegetative colonies. And on top of that, they have eliosomes. So ants disperse them and they're favored by wild turkeys, mice, bobwhites, morning doves, all of them eat their seeds. They come in purple, 
in blue, in white, in yellow, in purple and white, in purple, white, and yellow. <laughs> Rabbits eat the leaves, but deer don't usually. <laughs> and you can eat them. Their flowers and their leaves are edible. So I ask you, what's not to like? Common blue violet, I will never think you're common again. The Uvalarias, bellworts. We have perfoliate bellwort, Uvalaria perfoliata. Perfoliata, here's the stem per going through, per the foliate, <laughs> the leaf, per folia. And then we have the sessile leaved bellwort, Uvalaria sessifolia. Sessile, the leaf is next to the stem, not going through, the, the stem is not going through the leaf, it's next to it. <laughs> Native bees seek their nectar and pollen, pollinate them. They're a good example of a downward facing bloom. Like if you remember uh, trout lilies to better serve the bees that fly close to the florist duff. Bellworts make eliasomes so the ants disperse their seeds. And uh, I took both of these pictures in Little Bennett on the opposite sides, the left side, the right side of one trail. Very nice. So now I want to stop one more second here and say, go to different habitats. So much does depend on soil type, aspect, topography, hydrology in regards to what types of plants live where. There's a huge range of possibilities. If you're, you can't really tell from this picture, but this is a definite ravine here. This goes straight up. So the plants up here on the top are nowhere the same flower-wise than as down here in this wetland with scum cabbage. So there's a lot to explore. The next couple of slides are gonna highlight trees for their flowers and their many shades of green foliage. Trees, flowers are a critical source of food for bees and other pollinators. They provide nectar and nutrient-rich pollen via literally thousands of flowers that can be on just one tree. Plus, they're the larval host plant via the foliage for many, many butterflies, caterpillars, whatever. First, we'll start with the beech, the American beech, such a beautiful tree. Beech is definitely a noticeable component of many upland forests in the Maryland Piedmont. And in spring, watching these leaf buds open from this tight bud, the leaves unfurl. Isn't that gorgeous? I think that they come out to the translucent beech leaves. It just embodies the beauty of all of spring unfolding. And on top of that, it supports 107 species of butterflies and moths. And beech nuts are a seriously important wildlife food for birds, mammals, deer, rodents. It takes up to 40 years to reproduce just the first significant crop of nuts and beaches can live 300 to 400 years. So we've got to protect these things. One th other thought here, the caterpillars that 107 species of caterpillars do attract birds of course, and also hungry ants, wasp flies, and spiders who eat the caterpillars and thus keep the caterpillars from totally defoliating the trees. Again, the cycles, sassafras along the forest edges in the hedgerows. I love sassafras. It's a nectar source for pollinators, all kinds of pollinators, and the leaves are the, lar the larval host for spicebush and tiger swallowtails and the Promethea silk moth caterpillars. I myself just dedicate one whole week in the spring when these blooms are out because they're like gold shining up and down the hedgerows out in the farm areas. Sassafras are dioecious, that means male and female, different trees, and in the same family, which is Laurelaceae, as spicebush, so they're aromatic. If you've never smelled a sassafras leaf, you've got to do that. The females produce a lipid-rich dark blue berry, which is sought after by many songbirds, wild turkeys, bears, and then red maple, acerubrum, blooms early, 
by the end of April, it already has its seeds out. So not only is it making nectar and pollen, it has uh, all kinds of, as in 258 species of butterflies and moths that eat the leaves. The twigs and seeds also feed numerous additional vertebrate species, as well as provide shelter and nesting habitat. And then there's the oaks. <laughs> oaks support 410 species of Lepidoptera. Now oaks, this is a picture of a, a red oak, Quercus rubra, and we have them all over the place in Montgomery County. So I know you've seen them. Oak trees have male and female on the same tree. So they are monoecious in comparison with the dioecious that we were just speaking about. Here's a picture of the male flowers up close and a picture of the male flowers that come in catkins like this that hang down and where they're attached compared to the new leaves coming out, the new soft furry little leaves. Here we have Tupelo, Tupelo or black gum or pepperidge, Nissa sylvatica. I am crazy about the color of these leaves when they're backlit in the spring. And then redbud, Circus canadensis. So what's what do I want to tell you about this plant? Well, it exhibits something called coliflory, or maybe it's coliflory. I don't know, but I'm going to say coliflory. And what is that? That means that it's a plant that flowers and fruits directly from the main stem of the woody branches rather than from new growths and shoots. So see what I'm talking about? Here's the flowers coming directly out of the twig, the woody twig. Other examples of coliflory <laughs> that come to mind are coffee trees, cacao, papaya. If you haven't been to the National Botanic Garden right by the Capitol. Go down there and you will see the ones I just mentioned, papaya, coffee, cacao, with their fruits coming right out of their stems. They're rich in pollen and nectar and they're eaten by bumblebees, mining bees, long tongue bees, sweat bees, honey bees. But um, let's just cut to the chase and quit using highfalutin terms, what really counts is their flowers look like hummingbirds. Okay, so, you know, back here, if you see a redbud tree, you see how the little beak comes right out of the woody part? Okay, pick some, put them in your hand, and voila, isn't that cute? My uh, go-to place in Montgomery County parks to see redbuds is Coyles Mill Conservation Park in Boyd's, Maryland. And also in Boyd's, I was standing along, or rather, Coyles Mill Park. I was standing, looking down into a puddle on the edge of the trail. And I thought, good grief, this is so beautiful. So my words here are, be patient. Take time to observe. It's such a fascinating world, looking down, looking up. Try to clear your mind and come into the peace of the natural, natural world. Our natural areas are fast changing, if not disappearing altogether. So what we do when we walk into these homes does count. In Hoyle's Mill, I find this very pretty wild pink, Silene caroliniana. It's rich in pollen, bees, flies, moths, butterflies, even hummingbirds go to it. It likes to grow and only grows that where I've ever seen it on dry, rocky kind of habitats, outcrops. The same exact kind of place that columbine or rock bells, Aquilegia canadensis grows. What a perfect name for a gorgeous little plant, rock bells. See it growing right out of the crack of the rock? <laughs> They provide nectar for bumblebees, hummingbirds, hawk moths, pollen for bees. And besides just being a lovely little plant with delicate fern-like foliage and fascinating, bloom, fascinating blooms, it does come into flower right in sync with the first hummingbirds returning. Have you ever noticed that? Showy orchis, one of our native orchids. 
Galliaris spectabilis. And it is spectabilis, isn't it? If you ever come upon one of them in the woods and aren't expecting them, I guarantee you, you will stop and exclaim because they're that arresting. They're very small. They're only like four inches to eight inches tall, but they're lovely. They're pollinated by queen bumblebee species. They do produce nectar. And I bring that up because we'll be talking about another orchid here that doesn't produce nectar, but these do. Woodland flocks. Wild Sweet William, Phlox divericata. It provides nectar to bees and bee flies and moths, including sphinx moths, butterflies, and skippers. Its leaves are eaten by numerous insects, browsed by rabbits, deer, and it's fragrant. I took this picture along the CNO Canal because it grows in big drifts in various places along the towpath. You see it comes in purple and, and white. And then there's May. Ah, <laughs> uh, and I think a quote by the famous naturalist John Burroughs is perfect at this moment in spring, and all the world is glad with May. Yes, all the world is glad with May. These are spice bush in Little Bennett. And then there's May apples. May apples first poke up through the forest duff and unfold like little umbrellas, and then they make like little groves of palm trees and they progress. One important thing to know about them, like the trout lily, which takes eight years to come to flower, these come take five to 12 years before they can reproduce. And that's, they cannot reproduce until they have two stems. If you remember trout lily has to have two stems these are the same. Believe it or not, box turtles are the principal seed disperser <laughs> for May apples. As they start to um, fade away, because they are spring ephemerals and they drop down to the ground, the box turtles can get them and eat them. And it's they've been doing done studies that say the seeds have a higher germination rate after passing through a box turtle digestive tract. So there, lady slipper orchids, moccasin flowers, Cypripedium ocali. Look at that, it's gorgeous, but it is deceptive. <laughs> it's pollinated by bees, but the bees don't get a floral nectar reward. So the bees are lured into the flower patch right here through the slit because they're attracted by the bright color and the scent. And once inside, the bees find no reward. And they discover that they're trapped. And the only way they can escape is through a pair of openings up here at the top. But in order to get to that, they have to pass by the stigma, the female part, and they will then rub whatever pollen is on them from another plant onto the stigma. In addition, on their way out, the way that lady slipper orchids have their pollen, they store it in these pollen masses called pollinia, and there are two of them right by the doors out. So as they leave, the bees pick up new pollen. I'd say that's brilliant. One flowered cancer root, naked broom rape. Oh my God, what did this absolutely gorgeous little plant do to deserve such rather undesirable names? They're tiny but stunning, and they're fragrant. I show a picture here of my daughter taking a picture of them. You can't see her taking a picture of anything, and she has this up to magnify, big magnification, because they are tiny. They're like the size of my little fingernail. But when you get down and look at them, they are just beautiful. So on top of that, they are holoparasitic. And what that means is they're a parasitic plant that is not capable of photosynthesis. It has to obtain all of its nutrients and water from a host plant. And they do that by using specialized roots called Hastoria to tap into the host plant's xylem and foam. And uh, so the plants that this little naked broom rape <laughs> parasitizes are asters, goldenrods, saxifrages, and sedums. My Emmy mist, another teeny tiny, these are my fingers here. That's how tiny these are. Miami mist or purple scorpion weed. 
the Celia Persei. You can see here why it's called scorpion weed. It's in the family, borage family. It's an annual, it's specialized. Adrena bees are what pollinate it along with small beetles, ants, butterflies. Um, where did I find this? I found this in a roadside ditch on Old River Road when I was going to be walking and looking at the Shale Barrens Conservation Park, which is out on Old River Road. So just in a roadside ditch. What a beauty. So I've been showing all these tiny plants. Here we have <laughs> cow parsnip or Heraclium maximum. This is not tiny. This is my husband who is six foot tall. These plants <laughs> are already six feet tall, as you can see. This is an herbaceous perennial. So over the winter, in the fall rather, over the winter, it's died back to the ground. It doesn't emerge until, the, until March. <laughs> and by May 10th, look how tall it is. They're the only member, this Heraclium maximum is the only member of its genus in North America. And it's the largest native species of the carrot family, which is what it's a member of in the US. Now, it does have a relative, a non-native invasive relative that looks a lot like it and people get worried about, which is giant hogweed. But this is our native cow parsnip. I see this along the CNO Canal. And uh, it has easily accessed nectar and pollen. So you can see this large open umbel shape. So it provides food for a big diversity of insects. Mountain laurel, Calmia latifolia. This is another one that I'm sure everyone here knows. And it exhibits what's called explosive pollination. So in most flowers, the anthers are free and exposed to spread their pollen at the slightest touch of a visitor to the flower, but the mountain laurel has a different strategy. The pollen is well protected against rain and wind because the anthers are in these pockets of the flower. And when a pollinator lands on the flower, searching for nectar is when the weight of it acts as a trigger and it causes the taunt stem to spring out and hit the pollinator on the back and give it a dusting of pollen. Pretty darn clever. And then we have buzz pollination or sonic sonification of anthers, also known as the salt shaker technique, which is uh, the technique that our beautiful pinkster flower, native azalea has and does, rhododendron paracliminoides. So in order to extract pollen, the bee has to cling to the anther and give it a good shake, like a salt shaker. <laughs> it accomplishes this by vibrating its flight muscles. One source I read said that it was like running the car engine in neutral. <laughs> pollen comes out in clouds and clings to the body of the pollinator. And then of course, when the bee moves to the next flower, the pollen, uh, will dust the stigma of the next flower, or hopefully will. So it's not every bee that has this special pollen, this special talent. The non-native honeybees don't have the necessary skills to buzz pollinate. Native bumblebees, native mining bees and sweat bees do know how to sonicate. One other point, the az azaleas have an andrina bee called uh, Andrina cornelii, of course. What else requires buzz pollination? Good question. And here we have it, vacciniums, our blueberries, cranberries, they require buzz pollination. Here's deerberry, vaccinium staminium. You can see the stamens hanging out there. Uh, shooting stars and many solanaceae, also like tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, they require buzz pollination. Also on this page, I have tulip tree, 
Liriodendron tulipifera and fringe tree, Cyanthus virginicus, both beautiful blooming trees, which we see middle to end of May, and they're fragrant. A couple things to know, tulip tree can grow and live rather up to 300 to 500 years. Yeah, fringe tree is dioecious, male and female on different trees. It has diverse pollinators, including bats, <laughs> and it's the larval host plant for eight species of butterflies. It's also in the olive family, so the female ones make a small dark blue fruit, which is eaten by many birds, including cardinals, blue jays, mockingbirds, etc. Oh, don't want to leave without giving the word to the rosaceae family. All three of these are in rosaceae. Serviceberry, black cherry, blackberry. The black cherry or prunus serotna, it supports 285 species of Lepidoptera, 285. This is a tree that you often see in hedgerows and people think of as a weed tree. It's not a weed tree. It's an important tree in our whole system. So we're almost finished here, but I wanted to show four native orchids at the end of May. We have four. We have showy orchis, Galliaris spectabilis, which I showed you earlier. It's past bloom. We have the uh, Cypripedium macaulay, the pink lady slipper. I was very lucky to find this at the, near the end of May. And then we have two I haven't talked about yet, putty root and world pagonia. Now, both of these two were about a week past bloom when I saw them. But of course, last May, I didn't know I'd be giving a webinar <laughs> this year. So I, I didn't go out specifically looking for anything. I was just taking these for myself. What I want to point out here is that my daughter is taking a picture of this putty root. She is taking the picture, but you can't even see anything because it's so well camouflaged. And that's really good because I counted the number of individuals in the population here, and there were only five, five orchids in this population. It's the only one that I saw in the park, and she is sitting right next to a trail. So if it was a real showy thing like this, it might have... Uh, it might be picked. And that's the sad thing. And what I've said a number of times tonight, some of the native wildflowers take six to 10 years to go from seed to flower. Extensive picking can in some cases and does decimate these populations. And things like trilliums and orchids are particularly vulnerable. We, we need to protect them and provide careful stewardship. All right, second to last slide. I know I haven't talked at all about ferns tonight. And that's not because I don't love ferns. I love ferns. I've even, you know, I've taught a graduate class on ferns and fern, fern allies a couple of times. But anyway, for tonight, I'll just say, you might not yet know their names, but take pictures when you go out so you can identify them later. Always take your picture, your camera rather, or your phone when you go into the parks. You'll never know what you're going to see. And maybe take a small, inexpensive magnifying glass, too. You would not believe what you can see when you look at the back of a fertile frond of a fern, or what you see when you look into the face of a little spring beauty or any of these other plants I've talked about. Finally, we started in March, and it looked like this. And a mere nine to ten weeks later, it looks like this. <laughs> from no leaves on the trees to full leaf out, fringe trees blooming and palmia. So it's such a short moment in time, but wow, such a different world. One of the calming, reassuring, wonderful things for me is that all of this does repeat cyclically, but spring is such a short, special, special time of the year. So why not take advantage each chance you get? <laughs> Stop, listen, look, observe, examine, and marvel. Um, let the peace and the wonder of it all seep in. And remember, um, these places are precious. They're not just important. 
they're vital, basically vital. So let's protect. All right, that's it. Carol, thank you for this very special and very wonderful and welcome presentation. And the thanks are pouring into the chat box. The first question is you mentioned that the spring azures hit the nectar on the spice bush. Does that mean that they're pollinating as well on some plants while they're obtaining the nectar? Uh, for the spice bush, um, probably yes. You know, I don't know for sure, but I'll say why not? Yes, Ab absolutely. They're out there looking for nectar and um, they can't help but brush the pollen and move to their next flower. So why the heck not? Next question is whether it's possible to determine the age of a skunk cabbage. The questioner <laughs> has hundreds or more in back of their property in the Seneca Creek area. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, I don't know how to, to make a quick answer, but I'm sure that we can start researching these things it's amazing what you can find out when you really start digging into it because you've been uh, awakened <laughs> to the possibilities. So I'm sorry, I don't know, but maybe I can try to look it up. I'll write it down. The next question is about everyone's least favorite spring ephemeral, the non-native lesser celandine. Uh, Could you describe its reproductive characteristics? This person asks whether there is any hope of getting rid of it in their yard and does it have any benefit to some insects or to other plants? Um, I'll start with the last one. It doesn't have any benefits that I'm aware of. Um, but again, I, when I was doing the weed warrior trainings and such, that wasn't what I was particularly um, emphasizing were any of its benefits. So maybe it has one, I don't know. But how does it, how does it move around? It has tiny little bulbs or corms on its roots. And mostly you see them blooming, uh, moving like crazy through floodplains. And that's because in a floodplain, when it floods, the plants get flooded, it gets eroded somewhat, the bulbs come up, break off and float down to the next place they're gonna infest. Now in your yard, I'm not sure how you got it, but unfortunately um, they spread quickly, uh, whether they're in water or not. So I'm, I'm so sorry, you can get rid of them in your yard uh, if it's a small yard. <laughs> and you're willing to dig up all of the potatoes, I'm not telling you to um, use any herbicide, but the point is that in the beginning, you have to be very, um, what's the word, cognizant of how early they come out. Uh, very early, you'll see their leaves once you get to know what they are and you can dig down and try to work at it every year. That's about all I can say. Next, we have a question about cow parsnip, which is, do deer eat it? Um, that's a very good question. That sure looked like they didn't eat it. <laughs> deer eat almost everything, as you all know. I bet that they don't chow down on it a whole lot because you saw that incredible area that I was standing in. And it's a prolific plant along the canal. Now that doesn't mean they don't eat it, but um, I bet it's not their favorite food. Um, someone has seen toad shade trillium with both red and yellow flowers. Are they the same species? There is trillium lutea and there's trillium sesily. So I'm not really sure what to say on that. There are, there are two different plants. There could be a trillium that's more yellowish, but I, I can't really say what their one was. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, the next question, um, when you say that it takes five or 10 years for a plant or tree or bush to bloom and set seed, 
How long after that does it take to rebloom the next time? I don't think it takes this. It doesn't. Once they're of blooming age, they can bloom. Remember, there's, you saw so many different systems tonight. You know, ones that the, the males fertile first, ones of the female, once they switch back and forth. <laughs> One comes out every year. One has to be 12 years old. I can't say, but all the trees that I know of, once they have reached their reproductive age, like a white oak, it has to be 25 years old before once it you know, goes from acorn to reproducing itself, it's got to be around 25 years old. And you uh, heard that thing about the beach, make their first sizable crop at 40 years. Um, they keep going for as long as, as they go. <laughs> they don't alternate. Our next question is about red buds. How do they get pollinated? And is red bud a host plant for any butterflies or moths? I don't know that they're a house plant, but they get pollinated by all kinds of, of, bee, of bees, um, butterflies. They're, they've got a lot of pollen and nectar, so I'm sure a lot of pollinators go to them. How do tupelo trees uh, propagate themselves? <laughs> Tupelos come in male and female, and they also come in male and female on the same tree. So I thought by the time I got to Tupelo, I didn't need to um, confuse you even more. So I didn't mention that. <laughs> but uh, some Tupelos are only male, some are only female, and some are both. Um, so it depends on what the tree is. <laughs> and they propagate themselves by the, the same way, the, the male male pollen and the female pistol. Um, it, another question about skunk cabbage. You said that it can live for 200 years. Did you mean a colony or an individual plant? I mean that I read that, that a colony, but I am assuming colonies are more protected <laughs> and the plants do propagate them, you know, they, they grow out. So I don't know how many places you've ever seen just one cabbage, uh, skunk cabbage by itself. Um, but I haven't seen very many. So I tend to think it's a colony. But uh, again, I read that. I'm passing on something I read. I certainly as I mentioned earlier, don't know how to tell how old they are. <laughs> now we have a question about um, rare plants like lady slipper orchids. How important is it to protect those populations from deer? If they are not protected, will they eventually become exhausted and die out? I think it's important. The problem is um, lady slipper orchids uh, they're finicky. They're they're finicky, <laughs> or if they're not finicky. We're crazy, or whatever. Lady slipper orchids don't always come up year after year. Number one, first of all, they need, and I expect most of the people listening to this know that their seeds are almost dust-like, and that they need to land in the right place and have the right mycorrhizal association to even grow. And then they need to have keep having that. So that's why we say don't dig them up and move them because you won't have the right mycorrhizal association and they'll just die. That was perfect. Um, so I wanna say once again, thank you, Carol, for this wonderful presentation. And I will pass on to you all the thanks and praise that came in in the chat and thank you everyone for attending. Let, hey Anne, let me just thank everyone who did join because um, it shows you know if you're willing to sit through an hour of this you care a lot and we need we need people to care a lot um, so thank you. Thanks and good night everyone.